Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 12. In this part, I'm going to show you the derivation of Kepler's equation and how to use Kepler's equation. In the previous parts, we derived methods to determine the timing of an orbit along an ellipse. The equations I showed you worked well for animations, but aren't very satisfying if you want to determine the location of a planet at a given time. In this section, I'll derive a method to determine the position of a planet at any time in the orbital period. I'll also do the reverse, determine the time for any position in an orbit. This method uses an equation called Kepler's equation, shown here. It's a clever method that Kepler developed in the 1600s and is a demonstration of his genius. The equation is simple. The derivation is anything but simple. And I'll take you through the derivation here step by step. Let's start with an ellipse with a semi-major axis A. Pick a time, let's call it T. And then let's say at that time T, a satellite in orbit is at position P. Here's the position vector from the focus of the ellipse. This angle is the true anomaly. We want to figure out the true anomaly angle theta at time T. That's expressed as theta of T. If the time t were 0, the planet would be at point v, or the periapsis. Theta of 0 is thus 0. Let's call the orbital period t. That's the time it takes for the satellite to make one full revolution along its elliptical orbit through 2 pi radians. Theta of capital T is thus 2 pi. It also is equal to 0. After exactly one revolution, the true anomaly resets to 0. Kepler's derivation of his famous equation starts by inscribing a circle around the ellipse. The semi-major axis in both cases is A. For the circle, the semi-major axis is synonymous with the radius. We need a method where we can compute this area for any given angle theta, for any true anomaly. This is the area swept out by our hypothetical satellite at time t that it takes to reach the position P. Kepler started by first determining a formula for this blue area. That's defined by the points P, F, and V. If we drop a vertical line segment down from the point P, the position of our planet, it intersects at this point, and we'll call that S. If we project that line upward, it intersects with a circle at point Q. A line segment from the origin to Q forms the angle E. We refer to this angle as the eccentric anomaly. The eccentric anomaly forms a segment of the circle defined by points QOV. Computing the area of this segment is easy. We'll use this to derive the area of this elliptical segment, and we'll do that in a number of steps. I start by subtracting the area of this triangle from the area of the circular segment. It's a right triangle, so it's easy to compute. I'll then subtract out this irregular area. This area is not as easy as a right triangle, but there's a simple method. Lastly, I'll subtract out the area of this small right triangle, and then I'll be left with this area that I'm interested in. We're going to start with a derivation that helps us determine the area shown in purple. Here's the rectangular equation for an ellipse. An ellipse is all the points that satisfy this equation. This is the equation for a circle. Notice that both denominators are the same, a squared. The inscribed circle is all points that satisfy this equation. Let's solve for y. Starting with the equation for an ellipse, I'll subtract x squared over a squared from both sides of the equation. I'll then put a squared over a squared in place of the 1. And I'll put the right-hand side of the equation over a common denominator so that a squared minus x squared is over a squared. And then I'll take the square root of both sides. That simplifies to this. And we solve for both sides by multiplying, we solve for y by multiplying both sides by b. Then let's express it this way, b over a times the square root of a squared minus x squared. Solving for y in a circle is much simpler. Multiply both sides by a squared. Subtract x squared from both sides. Then take the square root of both sides. y equals a squared minus x squared. Here's the y value of the point p. And here's the equation for that value. It's the equation we derived below for the ellipse. 
y equals b over a times the square root of a squared minus x squared. Here's the y value for q. Here's the equation for the y value that we derived below. It's the square root of a squared minus x squared. Both equations have a have a common term, the square root of a squared minus x squared. The y-coordinate of p, the point on the ellipse, is b over a times the y-coordinate of q, the point on the circle. And here's that formula. Let's redraw the line segment from O, the origin to Q. That forms the eccentric anomaly E. We'll start by computing the area of this shaded region, which is the segment defined by points QOV. One revolution is two pi radians. The total area of the circle is pi times the radius A squared. The segment, the or orange segment, is a percentage of the circle. The angle E is the same percentage of the full 2 pi rotation. The area of the segment QOV is thus E over 2 pi, the percentage um, times pi A squared, the area of the circle. That reduces to 1 half A squared times E. Now we'll draw a line from the origin to the point of intersection P. The segment POV is shaded blue. We now want to derive that area. From the previous slide, we determined that the y value of the ellipse is b over a times the y value of the circle. The area of this elliptical segment is thus b over a times the area of QOV. Plugging in our equation for QOV, we get b over a times 1 half a squared e. We're not going to use this equation. We're going to use the scaling factor b over a, however. Let's change the color of the area QOV. We're now going to subtract out our first area, the triangle QOS. Subtracting QOS from QOV leaves QSV, the area in blue. The area of QOS is 1 half the base times the height. The base is cosine E. The height is A sine E. I'm sorry, the base is A cosine E, and the height is A sine E. The area is thus 1 half A cosine E times A sine E. Since there are two a's, we'll simplify that to 1 half a squared cosine e sine e. We can now substitute the formula for the area of QOV and QOS into this equation. The area of QOF is 1 half a squared e. The area of QOS is 1 half a squared cosine e sine e. And that simplifies to 1 half a squared cosine e sine e. Now we'll get rid of this area, the little curved section between the ellipse and the circle. Recall that the area of POV is B over A times the area of QOV. The area of PSV is thus B over A times the area of QSV. Let's repeat that down here. We know the area of QSV is 1 half A squared times E minus cosine E sine E. We'll substitute that for the area of QSV. The A's cancel and we're left with 1 half AB times E minus cosine E sine E. Now all we have to do is subtract out this triangle PSF. PFV, the blue area, the area we want to compute is the area PSV, which we derived on the last slide, minus the area PSF. This new little triangle we're going to subtract. The area PSF is 1 half its base times its height. The length to the focal point is A, the semi-major axis, times epsilon. And I'm using epsilon here for the eccentricity because I'm already using E for the um, eccentric anomaly. The length of the line segment OS is cosine E. The length of line segment SF is, this line segment SF is the base. The length of the base SF is OF minus OS. We can substitute the formulas for these two segments. The base is A times epsilon minus A cosine E. The length of the line segment QS is sine E. PS is the height of the triangle PSF. Its length is B over A times the length of QS. And here's the formula. The height PS is B over A times QS. That's B over A times A sine E. The A's cancel, so this simplifies to B sine E. The area of PSF is 1 half A epsilon minus A cosine E times B sine E. We can bring B outside the parentheses so that it's 1 half AB 
times epsilon minus cosine e times sine e. We can then multiply epsilon and cosine e by sine e. Now let's plug in the formula for the area of PSV into this equation and the formula for PSF. We can factor out 1 half AB from both terms and then let's get the terms outside of the parentheses. There's A plus sine before the last cosine E sine E because we had a minus outside the parentheses and inside. Minus A minus A is plus. There's now A plus cosine E sine E and A minus cosine E sine E. They cancel out and we're left with 1 half AB times E minus epsilon sine E. We now have a formula for FVP. This is the area that's swept out in time t. Remember that the orbital period is t. We said that the ratio of the time t over the orbital period capital T is equal to the area of sector FVP over the total area of the ellipse. We can now plug in the formula for the area of FVP into this equation. That simplifies to this. The ABs cancel and the two can go into the denominator. Here's that equation. We can express that equation this way where the angle theta at time t over the angle at theta for the orbital period, capital T is equal to E minus epsilon sine E over 2 pi. Let's put theta of capital T on the right hand side. Recall that theta of capital T equals 2 pi. At the time capital T, the planet has made one for evolution through 2 pi radians and thus is back at the zero point at the periapsis. If we substitute 2 pi for theta of capital T, we get this. The 2 pi's cancel and we're left with theta of T equals E minus epsilon sine E. Theta of T is now a function of the angle E, the eccentric anomaly, and the eccentricity. We don't uh, quite yet have Kepler's equation. If the orbit were circular, the point P would appear here. The planet would travel in uniform circular motion, the same speed throughout the orbit. We call this angle the mean anomaly. It sweeps out this area in time t. In the circular case, the origin O is the focus point, so M is the true anomaly and the eccentric anomaly. M is thus equal to theta of t, which equals E minus epsilon sine E. For a circle, a planet is in uniform, a satellite is in uniform circular motion. The angle M is simply part of the circle that is proportional to the ratio of the elapsed time T and the total time of the orbital period, big T. If the orbital period were four seconds, in one second it would have passed through one quarter of its orbit. For a circle it would have passed through one quarter of the area as well, which is 90 degrees or pi over two radians. M equals E minus epsilon sine E is Kepler's equation. If we know the eccentric anomaly E, we can derive the mean anomaly M. If we know the mean anomaly M, we can't derive the eccentric anomaly directly. This is what's called the transcendental equation. We'll have to use an iterative method to derive E that we'll discuss later. Recall that when we re what we really want to do is determine the time given the position P. Deriving M from E or vice versa doesn't get us there. We need a formula that gives us theta, the true anomaly. We'll start with deriving theta based on E or vice versa. This line segment Q, and I'm sorry, the line segment OS is A times the cosine of E. The length of OF is the length of the focal point. That's A, the semi-major axis times epsilon, the eccentricity. Let's call R the length of the position vector from the focal point F to the position, to the position P. Recall that the length of R is A times 1 minus epsilon squared over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. That's the length of R if the focus is on the right. SF is the X component of theta. SF in this diagram is equal to R cosine theta. Because we drew this with theta greater than 90 degrees or pi over 2, um, cosine theta is a negative number. The way these line segments add up makes more sense if we draw it this way. With theta less than 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, the X segment extends beyond the line segment OF. The points are in the following order, O, then F, followed by S. The length of segment FS is R cosine theta. The length se line segment OF is OS minus SF. If we plug in equations for OF, OS, and SF, we get A times epsilon is A cosine E minus R cosine theta. 
Here's an equivalent equation. We added r cosine theta to both sides of the previous equation and reversed the order of the equalities. Let's start with that equation. Recall that r equals a times 1 minus epsilon squared over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. This is the equation for polar coordinates for an ellipse whose focus is on the right. Let's substitute that equation for r in the first equation. The first thing we can do is take the a term out of both sides of the equation. Next, we'll put epsilon over a common denominator, and here's how that looks. Let's get rid of the parentheses in the numerator. There's an epsilon squared cosine theta and a negative epsilon squared cosine theta. Those cancel. The equation simplifies to this. This is a formula for cosine epsilon given theta. Let's derive a formula for cosine theta given e. This is our previous equation in reverse. Multiply both sides by 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. Let's expand the terms on the right. Cosine e times 1 is cosine e. Cosine e times epsilon cosine theta is epsilon cosine theta cosine e. Let's subtract epsilon from both sides. And then let's subtract epsilon cosine e cosine theta from both sides. We can factor out cosine theta on the left. And then we can divide both sides of the equation by 1 minus epsilon cosine e. This isn't how this is normally expressed. Let's make both the numerator and denominator negative. We can then express the formula for cosine theta this way. These are nice equations, but there's an ambiguity. Let's say we derive a value for cosine e based on some angle theta. We can determine the value of e based on the arc cosine of e. Let's say this is the angle e. Consider this angle minus e, however. It's the same as 2 pi minus e. The cosine of e equals the cosine of 2 pi minus e. And here's another way of looking at that. For a given value of cosine e, there are two possible values of e. Let's try this with sine rather than cosine. Recall that sine squared e plus cosine squared e equals 1. Let's substitute our equation for cosine e into that equality. Let's put all the cosine terms on the right and leave the sine term on the left. We'll do that by subtracting everything in parentheses from both sides of the equation. Let's put 1 over a common denominator so we can add the numerators. Then let's put everything over our common denominator. Let's then compute the squares of 1 plus epsilon cosine theta and epsilon plus cosine theta. 1 plus epsilon cosine theta squared is 1 plus 2 epsilon cosine theta plus epsilon squared cosine theta. Epsilon plus cosine theta squared is epsilon squared plus 2 epsilon cosine theta plus cosine theta squared theta. Let's substitute those expansions into our equation. Since we're subtracting epsilon plus cosine theta squared, we change all the signs to minus signs. There's a 2 epsilon cosine theta and a minus 2 epsilon cosine theta in the numerator. Those cancel, and that reduces to this. Let's swap the last two terms in the numerator. We can factor out 1 minus epsilon squared from the last two terms. There's a 1 minus epsilon in both terms. We can factor that out. This gives us this equation. If sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, then sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared. Let's make that substitution. And we get a formula by sine e for taking the square root of both sides. A formula that gives a cosine is ambiguous. So is a formula that gives a sine. A tangent function has the same issue, but not if we divide the angle by 2. Recall the trigonometry I derived on the previous part. Tangent E equals sine E over cosine E. Because tangent E is ambiguous, we're going to use E over 2. For reasons you'll see later, let's square both sides of the trig identity. Recall that the cosine of the sum of two angles, alpha and beta, is cosine alpha times cosine beta minus sine alpha times sine beta. Let's assume alpha and beta are the same angle, E. Alpha plus beta is thus 2e. The cosine of 2e is cosine e times cosine e minus sine e times sine e. That equates to cosine squared e minus sine squared e. We're going to use this trig identity again that I derived on the previous part. Cosine squared e plus sine squared e equals 1. That's the same thing as cosine squared e equals 1 minus sine squared e. Now, cosine 2e equals 1 minus cosine squared e minus sine squared e. Cosine 2e thus equals 1 minus 2 times sine squared e. 
Let's divide E by 2. The left-hand side is now simply cosine E. The right is 1 minus 2 times sine squared E over 2. Let's reverse the order, and then let's divide both sides of the equation by 2. Let's do the same thing for cosine squared E over 2. Let's start again with this equality we, that we derived earlier. This time we'll derive sine squared E from our trig identity. Sine squared E equals 1 minus cosine squared E. Now we'll substitute 1 minus cosine squared E for sine squared E. Let's get rid of the parentheses. Minus cosine squared E becomes plus cosine squared E. Cosine 2E equals 2 cosine squared E minus 1. Again, we'll divide E by 2. Cosine 2E becomes cosine E. And let's reverse the order of the equation. Let's then divide both sides of this equation by 2. We, have, we now have two equalities for sine squared E over 2 and cosine squared E over 2. With these equations, we can now simplify the equation for tan squared of E over 2. There's a 2 in both denominators. We can get rid of that. We want to derive E from theta. Recall that cosine E equals epsilon plus cosine theta over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. We can substitute that for each of the cosine E's in this equation. 1 minus cosine E equals 1 minus our formula for cosine E. Putting all that over a common denominator, we get this. If we rearrange terms in the numerator, we get this. We can factor out 1 minus epsilon. 1 minus cosine E equals 1 minus cosine theta times 1 minus epsilon over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. We can do a similar derivation for 1 plus cosine E. Substituting the formula for cosine E, we get this. We'll put everything over a common denominator again. That looks like this. We'll rearrange terms again. We'll factor out 1 plus epsilon this time. And that gives us this equation. 1 plus cosine E equals 1 plus cosine theta times 1 plus epsilon over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. Now we use these two formulas. Here's what our formula for tan squared E over 2 looks like. The numerator and denominator both have a common denominator. Those cancel out. We can rearrange the terms. If tan squared E over 2 equals 1 minus cosine E over 1 plus cosine E, then 1 minus cosine theta over 1 plus cosine theta equals tan squared theta over 2. We can make that substitution. Let's take the square root of both sides. Solving for E over 2 gives us the arctangent of the square root of 1 minus epsilon over 1 plus epsilon times the tangent of theta over 2. If we multiply both sides by 2, we get a formula for E. If we want an equation for theta, we'd move the term under the radical to the other side of the equation. To do that, we swap the numerator and denominator. Theta over 2 is the arctangent of this function. Theta is thus 2 times the arctangent of 1 plus epsilon over 1 minus epsilon times the tangent of E over 2. We've expressed theta in terms of E. We've expressed R in terms of theta. It would be simpler to express R in terms of E. Recall that cosine E equals epsilon plus cosine theta over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. Let's multiply both sides of that equation by epsilon and swap the equalities. Let's add 1 and subtract 1 in the numerator. And then let's make this into two fractions. The first term is equal to 1. We can move that to the other side of the equation. We have subtracted 1 from both sides and then made both sides negative. Now let's multiply both sides by A, and this equals R. Here's our new equation for R. R equals A times 1 minus epsilon cosine E. Here is Kepler's equation. We we'll use that to derive the eccentric anomaly E from M. Here's the equation for tangent of theta over 2. Here's the formula for theta, and here are two formulas for r. Let's look at a real example. Set a equal to 5. Let's set epsilon, the eccentricity, to 0 0.8. Let's set the period of our orbit to 4 seconds, and let's set the time t equal to 1 half a second. If the satellite were orbiting in a circular path, the mean anomaly would be 0 0.5 divided by 4 times 2 pi. That equals 1 quarter pi. m, the mean anomaly, thus equals 1 quarter pi, which equals E, the eccentric anomaly, minus epsilon times sine of E. Epsilon is 0 0.8. To 
Determining E starts with a guess. We'll guess one half pi or 90 degrees. E minus 0 0.8 sine of E equals 0 0.245 pi. M equals 0 0.25 pi. That's the value we're looking for, so we're close with 1 half pi. Let's try 0 0.55 pi for E. That equates to 0 0.298 pi, not 0 0.25 pi. Let's try 0 0.52 pi. That equates to 0 0.266 pi. Now let's try 0 0.51 pi. That equates to 0 0.255 pi. We're getting closer. Let's try 0 0.5051 pi. That equates to 0 0.250 pi, which is our answer. If m equals 0 0.25 pi, e then equals 0 0.505 pi. Now we can solve for theta. Let's plug in all the known values, epsilon and e. If you do all the calculations, you get 0 0.768 pi for theta. We can also plug in known values for r. If we plug in those values, we get 5.06. Here's a comparison of the two methods I've employed to determine the position of a planet in its elliptical orbit. The purple line was the method I showed you in a previous part that employed estimating segments of an ellipse with small segments of a circle. The blue line uses Kepler's equation to determine the position based on time. You can see that Kepler's equation is more accurate. I want to show you how to do this the other way around. Let's say we know the position P and we want to derive the time T. Let's say theta of T equals 0 0.8 pi. What then does T equal? Now instead of this equation, we use this equation that gives us tan E over 2 based on tan theta over 2. And instead of this equation, we use this equation that gives us E based on theta. Let's put the equation down here. Let's plug in values for epsilon and theta. E equals 0 0.508 pi. Now we use Kepler's equation and plug in E. M equals 0 0.2356 pi. M, the mean anomaly, is an angle within the inscribed circle. A complete revolution around the circle is 2 pi radians. Plugging in 0 0.2356 pi for M gives us this. That equals to 0 0.1268 as a percentage. We'll multiply that by the period of our orbit, 4 seconds. That equals 0 0.507 seconds. A true anomaly of 0 0.8 pi equates to 0 0.507 seconds for a period of 4 seconds, a semi-major axis of 5, and an eccentricity of 0 0.8. I want to show you how to set this up geometrically with Geometry Sketchpad, which I showed you in an earlier part. There's a built-in tool that lets me create an elliptical shape with two focus points and a handle. I want to draw a line through the two focus points. I want to draw a segment between the two focus points. I'll construct the midpoint between the segments. That's the center of the ellipse. And I'll label this O for the origin. Now, usually the origin of the ellipse is at the focus. For this, Kepler's uh, equation function, I want to set the origin to the center of the ellipse. And here I'm just changing the font size of the labels. I'll label this point F. This is the focus around which the satellite will orbit. And I want to put a point here at the intersection between the ellipse and the line and a point there. This intersection is the apoapsis point. This intersection is the periapsis point. Next, I'll construct a line from the focus to the ellipse. And I'll define this angle as theta. 
And by putting that point on the ellipse, Sketchpad will keep it on the elliptical shape. And I'll measure that angle. So I want to change the units of measure for angles to radians. Everything in orbital dynamics is in radians. And now I want to measure the distance to the focus. I'll call that F. And I want to measure the distance from the origin to the periapsis point. And this is the semi-major axis, which I'll label A. And now I want to calculate the eccentricity, which is F over A. And I'll label that epsilon. And now, given theta, I want to calculate the eccentric anomaly. So that's 2 times the arctangent of the square root of 1 minus epsilon divided by 1 plus epsilon. And that's multiplied by the tangent of theta over 2. And I'll calculate this again so I can label this capital E. And I did this twice just so I could show you the formula and label it capital E. Now with Kepler's formula, I can compute the mean anomaly. It's E times epsilon times the sine of E. And I'll multiply by 1 just so I can make this unit, un, these units radians. And then I'll do this calculation again so I can label this capital M for the mean anomaly. And now if I make or, the origin the center point, I can rotate the periapsis point by M radians. And you'll see as, as I move the satellite, as I change theta, that rotated point shifts and it rotates along a circle, which is consistent with the um, Kepler's formula construction that I showed you earlier. I can draw a line from the origin to that point I rotated by M radians. And now I can define this angle here as M, the mean anomaly. So the mean anomaly is where the satellite would be if it orbited in um, constant circular motion. And I want to change these markers so they go counterclockwise. So you can see by going counterclockwise when I go through pi radians, they're continuous. And I want to measure the angle M because you'll notice the computed M goes negative when I go through, when theta goes through pi radians. Here, this measured M goes from 0 to 2 pi radians. So as I change theta on the ellipse, Sketchpad computes the angle M, the mean anomaly. Now recall that I have to go backwards because there is no closed form equation that goes the other way. Let me define a period, uh, capital T, of 88 days. That's about the period of Mercury. And then let me define a parameter, little t, for the time. And let's pick 25 days. So if Mercury were in constant circular motion, the angle M would be little t over big T times 2 pi. And I can create that point by rotating the periapsis point.
and that's where the mean anomaly should be after 25 days of Mercury's orbit. So this is the target point. And that's where the satellite would be if it was in constant circular motion. So if I line up the satellite on the circle with the target, I get the theta equals 2.91 radians. So what this says is for an eccentricity of 0 0.85, that's where the satellite would be here after 10 days, theta would be 2.58 radians. Now I can change the shape of the ellipse. I can change the eccentricity. This is more what Mercury looks like. Now if I line up the satellite on the target, I get a theta for 10 days of 1.24 radians. If I want 50 days, I need to advance theta to here. So the satellite's on the target and that equates to 3.38 radians. So this is a rough way geometrically that I can estimate the value of theta for a given time in an orbit. Now I'd like to show you how to do this with calculations. So I want to set up a polar grid and use polar coordinates. Again, the measure of angles will be radians. And now I want to define semi-major axis as a parameter, and I'll set it to 5. And I want to set eccentricity, epsilon, as a parameter. And I'll set it to 0 0.8. And with Sketchpad, I can adjust these after I finish this construction. So now if I multiply A times Epsilon, I get the length of the focus. And I'll call that F. And here I want to compute the semi-minor axis. So that's the square root of A squared minus F squared. And I'll label that B. And with semi-major axis and semi-minor axis, I can use the equation that I derived in an earlier part to draw an ellipse with the center of the ellipse aligned with the origin of the coordinate system. And that formula is A times B divided by the square root a b times the cosine of theta. Squared. Plus a. Times the sine of theta squared. And the theta here is a generic theta. Sketchpad is going to use it to plot that ellipse. And so that's what an ellipse looks like that has a semi-major axis of 5 and an eccentricity of 0 0.8. I also want to plot a circle. And I simply do that in polar coordinates by plotting A for all thetas. And now I want to plot the focus as a point. And that's this point here. So again, usually with orbital dynamics, the focus is at the origin of the coordinate system. Not the case with Kepler's formula. So now this is the position vector for the satellite. And I'll label this satellite. Here's the angle theta. This is the true anomaly. And I want to measure that angle. 
So now if I move the satellite along the ellipse, that measured angle theta will change. And again, I want to compute the eccentric anomaly from theta. So that's two times the arctangent of the square root of one minus epsilon divided by one plus epsilon times the tangent of theta divided by two. And I'll calculate that again so I can label this E for the eccentric anomaly. And then with E, I can use Kepler's formula to compute M, the mean anomaly, that's E minus epsilon times the sine of E. And I'll multiply by one so I can make the units radians. And then I'll copy this formula again so I can label this as M for the mean anomaly. Now with this construction polar coordinates, if I want to plot the point M, on the circle, the length is A and the angle is M. And as I move the satellite now, M moves along the circle, or the point for M moves along the circle. So I'll draw a line from the origin to that mean anomaly point. Now notice I can't move M. In Sketchpad, I can only move the satellite. And I'll label this M for the mean anomaly. And I'll make these markers counterclockwise. So here I have the same construction. As I move the satellite along the ellipse, Sketchpad is computing the mean anomaly M that corresponds to theta. And here I'm going to measure the angle M, so it'll go from zero to two pi. Otherwise, M goes negative after you pass, after the satellite passes pi radians. So now I can compute the mean anomaly for any given theta. Now, the beauty of this is I can change the eccentricity and everything adjusts. I don't have to reshape things. I can change the semi-major axis in both shapes, adjust. And that's, in orbital dynamics, this is how we like to define ellipses with semi-major axis and eccentricity. So I mentioned that I drew this with the shapes centered at the center of the coordinate system. If you recall, this is the formula for an ellipse and polar coordinates with the focus at the center of the coordinate system. And here's what that looks like. And this is more proper in orbital dynamics. So we don't like the circle here. We don't like the ellipse there. We don't like the focus there. So the formula for that, which I showed you earlier, is A times one minus epsilon squared over one plus epsilon cosine theta. And I don't need B, I don't need F. All I need in this construction is eccentricity and semi-major axis. If I want a circle, I set the eccentricity to zero, but notice the circle centered at the coordinate system the focus of the ellipse is centered at the coordinate system. And this is the proper way to depict an ellipse in polar coordinates. The other constructions I did uh, merely as a way to transform theta to um, eccentric anomaly E to mean anomaly M, but it's not consistent with how things actually orbit physically. Here I want to show you how to do these calculations in Excel. I'm going to create 
cells for eccentricity, semi-major axis, period, time, target mean anomaly, and I'll show you why I'm doing that in a minute, mean anomaly, eccentric anomaly, true anomaly, and radius. This is the x-coordinate parameter and the y-coordinate parameter. And one of the things I like to do in Excel is use name cell references. And I can do that conveniently with that function. So notice as I scroll through the cells, on the upper left, names appear in the cell reference field. So here I want an eccentricity of 0 0.8, a semi-major axis of 5, a period of 4, and a time of 1. Now in here, I'm going to, oh yeah, I want to do one more thing. I want to create a uh, cell for pi. It makes the formulas a little bit simpler. And pi equals pi with parentheses. So here, I have a formula that will compute the target mean anomaly. I typed an S by a mistake, but it should be 2 times pi times 1 divided by 4, and I'll fix that S, make it a 2. And that's the mean anomaly at time t equals 1. This formula text is a handy way to show you what's inside the formulas. So here you can see the formula on the left, just 2 times pi times the time divided by the period. Here, I'm going to input Kepler's equation. So the mean anomaly is the eccentric anomaly minus the eccentricity times the sine of the eccentric anomaly and again, I want to display the formula text. You can see why named cell references are so convenient. And this is Kepler's equation right there. Now the formula for the true anomaly, I typed in S again, I'll change that to 2, is the arctangent of 1 plus the eccentricity divided by 1 minus the eccentricity times the tangent of the eccentric anomaly over 2. And I'll change the S to a 2. And that's my formula for true anomaly. Then the formula for radius, which is a name I gave for R, is the semi-major axis times 1 minus the eccentricity squared divided by 1 plus eccentricity times the cosine of the true anomaly. And I ultimately want to plot these, so I'll have formulas for the x-coordinate and y-coordinate, radius times cosine of true anomaly, and radius times sine of true anomaly. Now I'm going to create some parameters that will help me graph this in an intuitive way. So here I'm creating a table with the x and y coordinates. And then I'm going to put 0, 0 here, the origin. And I use this table to create a line segment on the graph. 
that I'm going to create for this. And I also want to graph an ellipse. So I'll create a table of theta values, r, x, and y. And the fill function in Excel lets me fill values along a column. So I'll select column. I'll step a tenth of a time. And 6.4 is a little more than 2 pi radians. And I like using tables, so I'll make this a table. One of the nice things about tables is I can enter a formula for R once, and it'll propagate. So here's a formula for the radius I already did. And if I substitute theta for true anomaly, you can see it fills the entire table. Now, x is r times cosine theta. y is r times sine theta. And with these x and y coordinates, I can plot an ellipse. So I want to insert a scatter chart with a line. I want to get rid of the title so I can proportion this. And I want to make the chart a square. And then you'll notice this turned into a circle, even though it's not. I can fix that. First, I want to fix the coordinates for the x-axis. And minus 10 and 2 is fine. And now I want to adjust the coordinates of the y-axis to minus 5 and 5. And that probably should have been minus 6 and 6, but it's close enough. Now I want to add a series. Now I'll call this vector. It's a line. And there are the x-coordinates, and there are the y-coordinates. And you can see a little orange line just showed up on the graph. And then I'm going to add the uh, satellite as a point. And the x-value is the x-coordinate, and the y-value is the y-coordinate. Now, you don't see a point on that graph. I need to go in to change the chart type and make the satellite a point. And now I have a little gray point that shows up. A blue ellipse, an orange position vector, and a gray point. Now, there's a cool feature in Excel called Goal Seek. I want to set the cell C9, the mean anomaly, to the target mean anomaly, 1.570796, by adjusting the eccentric anomaly. And cell will do, Excel will do the guessing here. And you'll notice now the position vector changed. So if I change the time to 0.5, the target mean anomaly changed. And now if I go into Goal Seek, I want to change cell C9 to that target mean anomaly. Zero point seven eight five three nine eight by changing the eccentric anomaly. And it derived um, the eccentric anomaly from that equation. Now let's try a time of 0 0.1. And when I click OK, it moves the point. So you can see for any given time, I can compute the position in the orbit where the satellite would be.
and I'm doing some formatting here. Here are the main takeaways from this part. This is the position of a satellite at time t. This is the true anomaly. It's the angle to the satellite from the periapsis point with respect to the focus. This is the mean anomaly. It's the position where the satellite would be if the orbit were circular with the same semi-major axis. This is the eccentric anomaly. It's a geometric construction that doesn't relate directly to the position of the satellite. We use this just algebraically. And we ultimately want to solve for theta of t. That's the true anomaly. The true anomaly corresponds to a time t. That's why it's theta of t. The mean anomaly is the area of the circle pi a squared times the time t over the period of the orbit, capital T. Kepler's equation is m, the mean anomaly, equals e, the eccentric anomaly, minus epsilon sine e. This is a transcendental equation, which means if you want to solve for e, you have to um, use estimates. There's no closed form solution. If you know e and you want to solve for m, it's straightforward. Theta is derived from this equation that takes e as an input. Here's the equation for r that I showed you earlier, and here's an alternate equation for r, if you know e. And here's the equation that takes theta as an input and gives you e. From here, you can plug e into Kepler's equation and solve it in the other direction. It'll give you m. And with this, you can solve for time t given position.